All right, welcome everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Marcia Eli. And on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library and the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents, and the Center for Brooklyn History, where we are right now, I have the pleasure of welcoming you and the honor, really, of leading this conversation tonight. Tonight is inspired by this extraordinary and beautifully written and haunting book, the Best Minds, a story of friendship, madness, and the tragedy of good intentions. It is about a brilliant young man, <clears throat> Michael Lauder, who suffers from schizophrenia, and the way our system failed him, and the violence he ultimately commits. And it was written by Jonathan Rosen, who is at the very end here, Michael's childhood friend. The book is a launching point to talk about the broader issues of how we think about severe mental illness and the history of how we think and how our society has dealt with it um, and the endless ways we've misunderstood and mishandled it and where we are today with Jonathan and we'll talk about it with Jonathan and two really um, thoughtful experts who uh, have a lot of connection which we'll hear about later. Um, I want to tell you, I was terrified to read this book <laughs> um, after reading the article in The Atlantic a year ago, uh, which was absolutely riveting and compelling and haunting, and uh, I, I couldn't stop reading it, and it just, you know, just my, my mind was in just a, a wreck. Um, and so when the opportunity came to have a program about the book because it's recently released in paperback. Um, I was terrified to read it, um, but I could not put it down. One of the one of the things that we talked about when I Jonathan and I spoke um, a couple of months ago about this program was just how we're all one step removed from severe mental illness, um, and I will say personally. That is absolutely true for me. I think it's absolutely true for all of us. Um, this is um, this is something that we all are connected to um, in, in in personal ways, and it's it's um, it's important to talk about. <clears throat> so I have many questions, but we'll also give you a chance to ask your questions. Uh, we're going to do that through index cards, and I think you were offered index cards as you came in, and we have. Um, our ushers who will hand them out for those who didn't get them because they didn't think they had a question, but then they decided that they do. Um, and then we'll collect those questions and ask those at the end. And I have many questions, <laughs> but I want to hear yours too. I also want to say that uh, the paperback is at the CBH shop as you came in. You probably saw it. Um, you know, I, I really I think everyone should buy a copy and buy one for someone else. I'm going to leave it at that um, because it is it is an, it is really an, an amazing, beautifully written, profound book. And Jonathan will sign copies at the end of the program. So, so let me tell you just a little bit about all the folks who are up here on the stage, and then we'll get into it uh, more formally. Jonathan Rosen is the author of The Best Minds, which was named the top a top 10 best book of 2023 by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic and People. In fact, the Times's Alexander Jacobs called it not just one of the top 10 best books, the absolute best book of 2023. He is also the author of two novels and his essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal and numerous anthologies. Next to him is Julie Sandorf, San Julie Sandorf has served as president of the Charles H. Refson Foundation since January 2008. Prior to Refson, she was a co-founder and executive director of Next Book, a national organization dedicated to Jewish literature, culture, and the arts. From 1991 through 1999, she was president of the Corporation for Supportive Housing, an organization she founded 
that worked to deliver permanent solutions to the chronic homelessness in partnership with philanthropy, nonprofits, and government. Julie has served as consultant, advisor, and board member to a very long list of important institutions, and I firmly believe that you'd rather hear from them than hear me talk about them, so I'm not gonna go into all of that. Um, but I will mention too, the National Mental Health Association, the Project for Psychiatric Outreach for the Homeless. And next to me on my left is Brian Stetton. Brian is currently Senior Advisor on Severe Mental Ill Illness to the Administration of New York City Mayor Eric Adams, where he works on policy to ensure psychiatric care and support for the most vulnerable mentally ill New Yorkers, also in collaboration with city agencies, community-based partners, and city's public hospital system. From 2009 to 2022, Brian was policy director for the Treatment Advocacy Center, a national organization devoted to removing legal barriers to the treatment of severe mental illness. And from 1999 to 2007, Brian was an assistant New York State Attorney General. It was in that role that he drafted the original proposal of Kendra's Law in 1999, as well as uh, significant amendments enacted in 2006. Subsequently, he served as counsel to the Health Committee of the New York Assembly and as special counsel to the New York State Commission of Criminal Justice Services. So thank you all so much for being here. I said a little bit about who each of you are, but I would like to start by, by having you talk a little bit about each of you, about how through your lives and work, you have experienced the um, the failures of the system firsthand. And Jonathan, why don't we start with you? Can people hear me? Is this on? Great. Um, well, I'm the only person on the panel. First of all, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm a huge fan of the people on my right. So I'm very additionally excited to be here. Um, I'm also the only person who doesn't actually have an area of expertise at all. I'm just a writer. Um, and it took me a very long time to decide that I could or should or would write the book that I wrote. And then it took me a really long time to write it. My daughter likes to tell me, who's 21, that she, my, my younger daughter tells me she was 10 when I started, which is true. Um, but in the course of coming to terms with my childhood best friend's tragedy, which was that although he was much celebrated for going to Yale Law School despite developing schizophrenia, he stopped and was written about in the New York Times in a glowing profile, which led to Ron Howard buying his life story to be a movie and Brad Pitt was going to play him. He stopped taking his medication and he killed someone who loved him very much, um, who he loved very much, excuse me, and who did love him very much. He killed his pregnant fiance. And so that encounter didn't, to my my encounter with that story didn't, didn't seem to me to be a story about the failure of the mental health care system because I knew nothing about it. I didn't know what the story really was. And one of the things when I began writing that was very moving for me is that Julie Sandorf, who I worked for at Next Book, uh, told me that Michael's story was not merely a personal story to me or to him, but that it was really emblematic of something that had played itself out across the city and cities and over time. And so, and Julie then introduced me to the work of Fuller Torrey, a remarkable psychiatrist and historian of deinstitutionalization. And it was Brian Stetton who was working at the Treatment Advocacy Center that Fuller Torrey created. And so uh, one of the experiences I keep having is that people I read as books turn into people. And the personal story that was my focus uh, led me to a whole world of history that then um, I, I had to figure out how that could actually shape and affect people's individual lives. So for me, um, I divided my book into four houses because I met Michael when I was 10 and my family moved to New Rochelle, which is a suburb in Westchester. 
and he lived across the street from me. We were best friends. And the first book is just our childhood. And the second book is The House of Psychiatry because there really was a beautiful big house in New Rochelle and psychiatrists actually lived in it. And they, be and they were very devoted to community mental health care. And they became the people, especially the mother, the father became a follower of the Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh. But the mother who was a psychiatrist furnished all the people who gave Michael his care. And they were devoted to keeping him out of the system. They had helped empty psychiatric hospitals. And the third book is The House of Law. And law and psychiatry are totally intertwined in this story as they are today. And in a sense, that house is Yale Law School, where Michael found extraordinary mentors. Um, and those professors who were so good to him had clerked for judges who had changed the institutionalization laws that had helped create the situation that Michael found himself in when he needed care and it wasn't around. And the last house is called the House of Dreams simply because um, that's the world of Hollywood, but it's also the world of storytelling. And one of the things I kept discovering is that it wasn't enough to tell this story or any story. I had to untell other stories because I myself was not just ignorant, but so um, misinformed about the nature of severe mental illness, about what it meant and what mental illness in general was as this big, broad, generic term that people still use all the time and what severe mental illness was. And so my coming to terms with all of those things brought me into contact with multiple failures. Last thing I want to say, and I'll, and again, it's because I have zero expertise. I'm always so moved whenever I speak or read because there are always people I meet who know not, they don't just know more than I do. They have experienced more than I have. Many people who are parents of children suffering from severe mental illness. I've never felt a book to be so collaborative in my writing it. And I've never felt a book to continue to feel so collaborative after I have published it. Um, but I was going to originally tell it backwards and begin with its tragic ending. But I realized that that made everything in the story feel like a tragic inevitability. And if I had met Michael in the glowing New York Times profile, I wouldn't have known him. And if I'd met him three years later when he was on the cover of the Post under the huge word psycho, I wouldn't have known anything about him. I had to go back and re-inhabit our childhood and tell the story forward. And so if, it, if I haven't taken too much time at some moment, the only reason I would ask is if I could read the opening three paragraphs, simply because, as I say, the, 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 um, what I realized in doing that, I will just do it, is that um, even though it was easy to think people made terrible choices, it was important to realize that they were choices, and often in that moment, they weren't terrible, and they had inherited a world that was the product of other people's choices. And so... Um, it made me feel, it made me able to understand better the world I was writing about and the world that we're all still in. So I want to make sure everyone can hear you. Okay. So I will hold this closer. Is that better? We, we talked about whether I ought to have a lavalier, but sometimes I move around so much, it just goes shooting off. So, but I will try to hold this into uh, up right up here. Um, I'll read a little stanza. There's an epigraph in front of every chapter and before every book. I love epigraphs. It's kind of like collaborating with all these writers or pop songs. You get to bring them into your work. Um, but also, Michael, who was brilliant and read incredibly fast and had a photographic memory, had the kind of mind where it was all overtness and he was very forward. I have dyslexia, not that I knew it at the time. And so, I loved memorizing a few lines of poems, of a poem, A, because it was like a portable library, and B, because it kind of stood in for all the things I hadn't read yet that I hoped to. So I'm just going to read the very opening stanza of a poem that is how the book itself begins. It's a stanza from a poem by William Butler Yeats. I call to the mysterious one who yet shall walk the wet sands by the edge of the stream and look most like me being indeed my double, and prove of all imaginable things the most unlike, being my anti-self. William Butler Yeats, Ego Dominus Tunis.
I am going back 50 years before the lurid headlines, the Hollywood deal, the publishing contract, and the New York Times profile of the role model genius who finished Yale Law School against all odds. Before delusions mistaken for stories and stories mistaken for life. Before the fancy clothes you bought for management consulting and wore into the hospital, the halfway house, and the Gatsby house you guarded with a baseball bat against enemies disguised as friends and family, guarded in turn by beloved neighbors. I am going back to the time before you graduated from Yale summa cum laude, which I always thought of as summa cum laude since you achieved in three years what I failed to accomplish in four. Before high school, where you ran while I was beaten, and the horror 20 years later when it was my turn to run. I am on a road racing backward out of a tragic sorrow whose circles radiate in all directions. Forgive me, I know there is no road and it isn't racing backward or forward. I know there is no going back, but here I am on a short street in New Rochelle. There is a green and white colonial house at the top of the hill and a brown and white Tudor house at the bottom. There are two 10 year old boys who live in those houses, even now. They're just illusions, but they're also real, and they're where I've got to start. Thank you. Thank you. Julie. Is it time now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Listening to Jonathan, I realize how most amazing, joyful, and in many ways sorrowful our serendipitous journeys have been. I met Jonathan 24 years ago, and, uh, and having nothing to do with this topic at all, and have the, the great privilege of now being for the second time his backup band, which I'm really honored to be. Um, I came to these issues both serendipitously and familiarly. Um, in 1989, I was uh, running a program revitalizing neighborhoods all over New York City, um, doing affordable housing development, community development, and two Franciscan priests, Father John McVeigh and Father John Felice, came in their full Franciscan robes to see me and said, why can't you do for homeless mentally ill people what you do for neighborhoods all over this city? And I looked at him and them and said, because I don't know anything about homelessness and mental illness. And uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, and I thought I was certainly damned to hell for the rest of my life because these two priests asked me to do something I couldn't do. Fast forward, I was at a very, very well-resourced foundation and decided to spend the day, uh, this was in 1989, um, and I should give you the backdrop. In 1989, the 168th Street Armory in Washington Heights, its drill room floor had 1,500 cots that were filled with men who were homeless, many of whom had chronic mental illness, tuberculosis ran rampant, and the city was paying $20,000 a year to have these people in what can only be described as Dickensian situation. A few blocks north on 184th Street, Ellen Baxter, who was the founder of the Coalition for the Homeless, decided that it was very nice to advocate, but maybe she ought to figure out how folks can be housed and live in community. And she created the Heights, and it was like what the fathers were doing, scraped together all sorts of capital and service money and created a place where people who had been homeless, many of whom with serious mental illness, working people could live in their own apartments with a key to the whole range of service supports that not only supported their stability, but made them feel at home and made them feel like they belonged to somewhere and belonged to each other. And she was doing it at about $10,000 a year per person. And I 
looked at her and I said, why isn't this business as usual? And um, she said, because nobody's gone out there and done it. And from that came the Corporation for Supportive Housing. And really, the other person that binds us three was in my sort of researching on why wasn't this the answer to, to homelessness? Why wasn't this national policy? I spent an afternoon with Fuller Tory. And Fuller Tory said to me, you just have to do this. And I said, I was 31. I said, okay. Uh, and from that became really sort of the movement for the idea of permanent housing with enriched service supports where people could live with dignity and community. Um, I just want to interrupt yeah. and make sure that people know who Fuller Tory was. I know he was an acolyte for all of you. But who was Fuller Tory, or is? So, uh, you, Brian, you know him best. You want to answer that? Fuller Tory is a brilliant research psychiatrist uh, who actually became a psychiatrist because uh, his sister, when he was a, a teenager, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and the absurdity of being told by um, his sister's doctors that it was his mother's fault, that it was uh, a result of uh, mistakes made in his sister's upbringing that that led her to that horrible disease um, and just him wanting to bring information to the world about what what actually caused schizophrenia um, he l launched this this uh, career and um, spent many years working at St. Edwards uh, which is a public hospital in, in Washington DC uh, while he was at St. Elizabeth's thank you excuse me <laughs> Uh, while, while doing uh, his, his research um, with, with most of his time. And uh, at one point came to realize that the laws that had been created in the deinstitutionalization era with, with great uh, idealism in the 1960s had become so much a part of the problem as to why it was so hard to get people treatment when they needed it desperately. And so he went on then to form an organization called the Treatment Advocacy Center. So through, and of course he's written many books, including one called Surviving Schizophrenia, which has uh, become the Bible really for families who find themselves with a loved one uh, diagnosed with that illness. It's been, I think it's in something like 15th edition. So a giant in the field. And so I read Fuller Torrey's book on how did we come to in the 1980s, thousands of people living on the street who were clearly extremely ill. Um, I know we'll go into all those reasons, but parallel to the sort of serendipitous professional journey I went on, um, my sister Lisa was born with multiple disabilities, including emotional, psychiatric, and developmental disabilities. And um, I became her guardian, um, I guess it must have been 25 30 years ago when my mother passed away. And my mother protected us from how difficult it was to have Lisa be safe and stable. But when she died, I got the crash course. And Lisa's journey is not that different um, than the person you are seeing living on the street, talking to him or herself, except that she had family and we had some resources. Um, she lived in a Salvation Army residence, had continued rages all the time. When she was in her, must have been late 30s, um, she got, she was Jordan Neely. She, except she was four foot nine. She flew into a rage on a subway, in the subway train and was escorted by two police officers and brought to Bellevue ER. Wouldn't tell them who she was or her name. Finally, she gave him my, them my mother's name and my mother got her and my mother did not know what to do. And she got thrown out of the Salvation Army residence she was living in. And fortunately, because I had a network of nonprofit organizations who were my colleagues and friends, she was able to get a small studio apartment in the Prince George Hotel, which was one of the first supportive housing developments in New York. She uh, continued with her rages, but there was a lot of tolerance at the Prince George. 
had a had a stroke and uh the stroke just completely destroyed her frontal lobe and could she could not live in a relatively independent housing anymore we basically had her with 24 hour care in an apartment and we tried des and she was literally in the site er at st luke's at least once a month if not twice a month and every time they would bring her they, you know the fdny would bring her i would call the site er and say please keep her there please admit her and within 24 hours her rages would stop and they'd say well we don't have any reason to keep her and she would be out again and finally, because of other connections and networks, I was able, we were able to set up a situation <laughs> where when she flew into a rage, we had informed the EMS people to bring her to Columbia Presbyterian ER where we knew she would get admitted. My husband, who was a doctor there, pulled every string in the book to get that to happen. Every chip got cashed in. She was able to stay in the inpatient uh, ward at Columbia for about three weeks. And it was the first time in her life that she was under psychiatric care and could be medicated. She never, she refused medication. And lo and behold, this beautiful woman came out of it, what was somebody who had so much rage and so much anger and so much emotional baggage and she couldn't go back to any kind of independent living and again because of networks and contacts we were able to put her in a much higher service level uh supportive housing where medications were managed and in that five-year period between when she lived at Fleming House and unfortunately when she passed, there was not a single trip to a psych ER for five years. And she fell in love. She fell in love with another resident at Fleming House and she found joy in her life. What that took was a lot of resources, a lot of connections, serious social capital, but what Lisa was able to have should be available to anyone with a serious illness. And it's not. And I can go into those reasons, but I don't want to monopolize. So Brian, I'm going to hand it to you. Maybe you'll pick that off. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Brian, I, you know, I, you really, were there in 1999, jumping in to fix this. So I'd love to have you talk a little bit as you describe your sort of connection to the failures of the system about what you, why you did that and what you saw, what happened. Sure, thank you so much. And what a great honor to be part of this event tonight. Um, so I spent a long time at the Treatment Advocacy Center, as has been mentioned, the organization for where Tori started. And just about all my colleagues there were very much in Dr. Tori's mold. That is, they were drawn to the work. It had become their kind of life's mission because of the struggles of, of a loved one, very much as Julie has described. I had a lot of colleagues who were, had a, a, a sibling or a, a parent or, or a child with severe mental illness who had been victims of the dysfunction of, of the public mental health system. And uh, I came into this work a very different way. I was very fortunate not to have um, that experience or, or, or see anyone very close to me have it. Um, but I was a, a young assistant attorney general 25 years ago. Uh, it was actually the evening before my first day on this new job coming in with the, the administration of, of Elliot Smith Spitzer. And I was supposed to be working in this program development unit, which was um, designed to develop legislative proposals uh, for the attorney general to propose, mostly as we imagined related to the basic functions of the office, such as consumer protection, did not in any way imagine that that, that, that an issue like this would, would be dropped in my plate. But it was the evening before that first day on the job that a, a young woman named Kendra Webdale was pushed into the path of an oncoming train uh, 
um, by a person with schizophrenia named Andrew Goldstein, a young man right about her own age, um, who had perceived her as a threat to him and his delusion. And, and um, you know, th th this was kind of splashed on the, on the covers of the tabloids on our first day on that job. And before I even had a place to sit, I was asked by the attorney general to develop some kind of a proposal in response to this, you know, what was already kind of an obvious uh, injustice and, 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 and tra travesty that, that people in psychiatric crisis were roaming the streets of the city, unmonitored, uncared for, um, and unmedicated. And, um, you know, I had to give myself a crash course in, in, in all that was wrong with it, with the public mental health system. And I connected with an advocate I had had some person, a little bit of connection with before, a guy named DJ Jaffe, um, who, uh, who absolutely was hugely uh, influential. And he, he had actually just been involved in founding the Treatment Advocacy Center and so connected me with the staff of that organization. You know, and I learned in, in short order about, you know, this reality that in New York State, as in most states at that point, if you were in psychiatric crisis to the point where you were a danger to yourself or others, and as that were interpreted, that meant you, you were at some imminent risk of hurting somebody, you could be confined in a hospital. But as you began to stabilize with medication and reach the point where you no longer pose that imminent threat, you were released from that hospital, but without any attention paid to the underlying problems that made it so hard for you to stay engaged with treatment in the first place. And so it almost became inevitable, I quickly learned, that people were stuck in this tragic revolving door and just repeating the cycle and you know, often winding up in the clutches of the criminal justice system if they weren't lucky enough to get to a hospital before something terrible happened. And so I was involved in developing this proposal which became New York's outpatient commitment law, which uh, the idea behind that being that when you have someone who has demonstrated this history of, of having trouble engaging with their treatment by no fault of their own, it's part of a, it's a manifestation of the illness that people often don't recognize their own need to stay engaged with treatment. Uh, but when we could identify these people through uh, this happening to them a couple of times, we could release them under a court order to stay engaged with treatment. And that's actually a mutual court order where the treatment system would also be expected to provide the services the person uh, would need. And so when we put this proposal out into the world, uh, in my youth and naivety, I actually expected the, the mental health community to just embrace this universally and that we would be uh, applauded. And I was so taken aback by the controversy that ensued, the fact that they were actually people who call themselves mental health advocates who were outraged and horrified by this idea that we were going to interfere with people's treatment decisions, right? Who saw that right to refuse psychiatric treatment as being akin to somebody with cancer making a decision of whether they want chemotherapy without taking into account that the illness itself was interfering with the person's ability to make those decisions. The, 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 the injustice of that, that, how much it enraged me that this was controversial, I think kind of connected me, bonded me to this issue uh, in a way that, you know, for all the other things I would go on to work on in the attorney general's office over the years to come, there was just nothing that meant as much to me as this. And, you know, years later, I wound up going to work for the Treatment Advocacy Center for, just because I was so driven by the need to counteract that um, just flipping of, of common sense on its head. Thank you. So one of the things that um, I think a lot of people just don't really understand is what is schizophrenia? And Jonathan, in the book, you paint a picture that lets you get it. You know, uh, you know, as you describe Michael's delusions and intrusive thoughts and his writings and so on, could you help us all understand what is in the head of a person who has that? I'm going to give you my mic. And I will hold it close. But if you can't hear me, raise your hand. Um, not everyone experiences schizophrenia the same way. For Michael, he had hallucinations and he had delusions. He had them for three years before he was diagnosed. He was in what was called a prodromal phase. So he graduated from Yale. We both went to Yale. He graduated in three years, went to work for a management consulting firm. He was going to work for 10 years, make a lot of money, and become a writer. We were both going to be writers. But after the first year, he left. He left because he began to see the secretary suddenly as someone with claws, with um, blood in her teeth. 
uh, he began, he became convinced that the people who ran the company were never going to let him leave. He thought his phone was tapped. He played music at a bookstore called River Run. He was sure that the other musicians were following him home. He began to see Nazis on the street. And when he was eventually, when he eventually had his psychotic break, he was convinced that his parents had been killed by people who looked just like his parents, but who were actually Nazi replicas of his parents. And so he began to patrol his house with a kitchen knife, which, again, what was so profound for me to try to understand is that that's actually a perfectly rational response to something that is entirely un irrational. And so it isn't as if logic abandoned him. It's just that his sense of reality was he was completely separated from what was real and what wasn't. And so um, the fact also that I had heard from my parents when he was hospitalized um, that he had that his mother had called the police was my first introduction to two things. One is she was afraid because he was patrolling the house with a knife and he didn't think she was who she said she was. And the other thing was that for some reason you didn't call the hospital or an ambulance, you called the police. It took a lot to discover what it took for the police to kind of become the unofficial ambulance service for people who were severely ill, partly because psychiatry had kind of abdicated an aspect of, the, of its role and partly because violence had taken the place of this of the illness or this it was the only symptom that could gain you admission to the hospital even though it isn't a symptom it's an effect of the symptom that you might have and uh so that was itself a remarkable thing because you don't want to stigmatize someone who has a severe illness but it's important to look to remember i always tell people that a diagnosis when they came along was can seem to us now to be only stigmatizing but it took the place of demonic possession character failure it meant that you had an organic brain disease you had a medical condition for which there was care you needed care and there could be treatment uh, and so uh, but i noticed that whenever the people who were most responsible in a sense for watching him were most afraid of ever acknowledging the reality of his illness and he himself, when he was medicated, and medication worked quite well for him, saw himself not quite as ill because he functioned well. And when he didn't take his medication, he simply did not believe that he was ill. I spoke two days ago, and a woman raised her hand and said, could you tell people what anosognosia is? Uh, and she was, it turned out later, it's the mother of someone who had schizophrenia. Anosognosia is the term people use for those who have as a symptom of their illness an inability to recognize that they are ill. And because schizophrenia is a thought disorder, and because our minds are how what we use to interpret and understand and recognize the world, there, there's almost no way you are, you would doubt the very thing that is how you've been affirming the reality of the world all along. And so uh, it means that without a kind of coercion, he was not going to get help once he went off his medication. And people, exactly as Brian said, were convinced that they were honoring his autonomy, but they were actually facilitating his illness, and they were really setting the stage for this terrible tragedy. Um, let, let's get into... A, just a brief bit of history, um, uh, you know, of how our society has um, addressed what we're calling severe mental illness. I mean, things have changed a lot. You mentioned something about, you know, there was a day in the, you know, not so long ago, right, when psychiatry felt that those who were schizophrenic basically could blame their mothers. Um, you know, so that's that's changed and evolved. But I also, I want to hear how we've changed and evolved in terms of the institutions and the ways that um, our communities, our societies, our, our governments have uh, provided 
support services addressed severe mental illness. And I'll throw that to anybody. And also what's, right. sitting next to these two, but I will start. And just to read you a couple of statistics. And this is just for New York State. So in 1955, nearly 95,000 New Yorkers were living in state-run asylums. By the late 1990s, most were effectively closed. Um, I look at this as there being two original sins. And I'm sure there are more that you can add on. One is that when the state started closing institutions, which was really the 60s when there was this promise of medication and President Kennedy you know, was the leader and saying, we can take care of people in community and this is going to, you know, and these hospitals are horrible places, which a lot of them were, we can take care of people so much better in the community. And that promise was never realized. And I think one of the original sins here is that as these hospitals were being closed and as the money that was used to run these hospitals were never dedicated to a specific fund for supporting individuals with serious mental illness in community. It went into the general treasury. So it became a big cost savings to, to close these places. The incentives were totally warped. The second original sin in my mind on a policy basis was the landmark le Medicaid legislation in the 1960s, where the federal government decided that Medicaid would not pay for long-term psychiatric care in buildings over 16 beds. Great intentions, but that meant that you could not, you know, there was not going to be any federal Medicaid funding for hospitals for long-term care in state institutions. And all of that cost savings occurred to the state treasury. I would also argue that the last nails in this coffin um, really occurred under Governor Cuomo's time as governor, starting with the Burger Commission, which was a commission on how to reduce costs in Medicaid. And they slashed Medicaid funding by up to one third for inpatient care and acute care hospitals. And from there, pay payments stopped, dropped significantly after 12 days. It reduced the few inpatient state hospital beds remaining by 20% between 2013 and 2018. Of the total psych beds in the state's mental health system, New York State psychiatric hospitals represent under 30% of the entire state's inpatient psych capacity. Acute care hospitals account for more than 68% of the psych beds, but because of these dramatic cuts in Medicaid, voluntary hospitals, nonprofit hospitals, like New York Presbyterian and others, basically have been abdicating their responsibility. And the burden has fallen, at least in New York City, almost completely on the health and hospitals, the public hospital system, which is woefully underfunded. Um, New York City, when in 2000, New York State had 6, 000, over 6,000 certified acute care psych beds, uh, and that's the inpatient intensive care. In 2018, the number dropped by 12%. Uh, New York City bore the brunt of these closures. 72% of closed beds were in New York City. 67% of those closed beds were in the voluntary hospitals. And the last and one of the most painful statistics to me is that Rikers Island is New York's largest mental hospital with approximately 1,200 people with serious mental illness at Rikers on any given day at a cost to all of us of upwards of $1,000 a day. That, that covers a lot. And um, of course, also Jonathan wrote, writes really vividly in, in the book about the, just the 
policy failures and the myopia and the creation of the um, community uh, mental health centers um, at the time the state hospitals were closed in, in the 1960s and, and, and how they just kind of completely whiffed on the question of how are we going to make sure we get treatment to people who can't recognize their own need for it, right? We can create community centers with the idea that people are going to come in for services, but when we haven't accounted for the reality that people with the most severe illness don't recognize they have an illness and, and, and really want no part of services, sometimes they're kind of racked by these terrifying delusions that, that, that put them on a, on a mission to, you know, accomplish something grandiose. And the last thing that they're thinking about is, well, I, I should probably take care of my mental health and go get some medication. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that kind of went along with kind of leaving this problem in the hands of, of, of community mental health centers that were really destined from the beginning to only serve people who wanted treatment was um, a curtailing of the legal standards for what it took to actually get somebody treatment when they didn't recognize their need for it. And, you know, I'll be clear about the fact that the way those laws were written in the, the pre 1960s era, right, when uh, one doctor's testimony that it was in somebody's best interest to get, to get psychiatric treatment and be confined for it was, was enough to get somebody hospitalized. And, you know, uh, look, I'll be the first to admit that, that you know, that, that's really too far in, uh, on the other end of the spectrum um, and just really made it too easy to hospitalize somebody who might have been just a little bit of eccentric or, or, or some kind of a, a bother to their family. But I think what happened with the way that some of these laws were changed in that same era, within that same spirit, is that the pendulum swung so far to the other extreme that it now became the case that you could only get somebody involuntary treatment at the point when they were a danger to themselves or others. And that came to be interpreted as meaning the person was suicidal or actively violent or engaging in some outrageously dangerous behavior, such as you know, trying to fly off a rooftop or walking into traffic. And while all those certainly are examples of people being dangerous to themselves or others, what that sort of left out of the equation was that wide swath of people who are a danger to themselves in a way that is leading them on a path to destruction slowly and steadily, but they are not necessarily at imminent risk of harm at the moment you encounter them. So if you think about the people we see every day in the, in the subway system in New York City, right, who are disheveled and filthy and emaciated and, and, and clearly on a really bad trajectory, um, th 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 that alteration of those laws kind of left them out uh, of any opportunity to get help before they reach that moment of imminent risk of harm. And of course, it's not always possible to time your intervention at the very moment somebody's on death's door or is about, or is about to do something awful, which explains why we have really trans-institutionalized people, right? We've criminalized the problem and we now have uh, more people with psychiatric illness in jails and prisons than we ever did in hospitals. Um, and so I think that's just another real piece of, of, of where we've gone so wrong. I would just add, I mean, those are both great accounts. One of the things that makes it so hard is that there are so many ways to tell the story and so many things happen along the way that change how people see the story. And one thing I like to say is that in like 1954, the first antipsychotic medication was patented. Uh, and that's the same year that LSD was given to psychiatrists to try to figure out if they could use it. So basically, psychiatrists had a drug in one hand that induced hallucinations, and they had a drug in the other hand that suppressed them. And the culture decided that the hallucinations induced by the drug were the product of mind expansion and gave you a vision of the world that was enlarged, uh, which meant, in a sense, in the eyes of that moment, that people who naturally saw things in a different way, people who naturally hallucinated, were almost like a priestly class. And so it was a kind of borrowing of, the con of a condition of severe illness for the benefit of everyone else. And Freud himself had done that because Freud didn't treat people with severe mental illness, but he drew a lot of his principles and understandings the way he did from dreams from people with psychosis. And when he wrote The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, what he was really doing was saying everyday life is psychopathological. So if you were a psychiatrist, you, they used to be called alienists. Instead of living with your patients in a huge state hospital, 
in a rustic setting, you could open an office and treat people formally considered well and have a normal business. And it was uh, psychoanalysts that became the dominant kind of psychiatrist. And they kind of forgot about the brain and the body itself. And so uh, it was psychoanalysts who were presiding at the time that medication was discovered. They're not the ones who discovered it, but they fitted it into their larger model, which was that everyone is made sick for the same reason and everyone can be treated. So instead of calling them community psychiatric centers, they called them community mental health centers. So instead of a psychiatric hospital where the most severely ill people with intractable with an intractable disorder went for which there was no treatment at the time they then created a model that was a public health model that was supposed to be a center for every hundred thousand people and they talked about prevention now there was no prevention for severe psychiatric disorders there still isn't but they created a sense that somehow the entire let's heal the whole country because it was impossible to heal this handful of very sick people and um, public health is an amazing thing if you have a vaccine that actually works for a communicable disease and everyone needs it. But if not, what you wind up then doing is creating agencies devoted to the care of everyone. And in a way, the people who are least treated, because if everyone's ill, no one is, are the people who require the most care. And I've read astonishing memoirs of in just super idealistic young psychologists in the 60s who set up shop in bad neighborhoods and they thought everyone needed care because poverty they thought makes you mentally ill and they adopted the psychoanalytic model instead of the family making you sick the city made you sick bad housing made you sick you know marginalization made you sick so they only wanted to care for people who just lived in that community and what this man said who ran the place is that if you lived in that community you were just a, and you had the bad fortune of having a sister or mother or father who had a severe illness, you were just as marginalized and poor as everyone else, plus you had someone who was psychotic. And what did you do? You called the cops. And you literally can see how idealistic people with a utopian vision criminalized severe mental illness. And that so shattered the system, especially because, and I'll just add this also, again, I understand why, but the architects of community mental health didn't want the state system to be reformed. And it's, I think it's always important to remind people, state hospitals were an amazing thing when they were created. Dorothea Dix was a remarkable woman who, among others, went around in the early 19th century to every governor in the country and said, people are, can't, you can't leave people on the streets. You can't lock them and chain them in basements. Those were true snake pits. And she persuaded them that a worthy, that a civilization worthy of the name would create a place that was airy and light. It was called moral care. They were in rural settings. They had gardens, landscaped grounds, and they were to provide for those who could not care for themselves. And they were built like opera houses and public libraries. And um, they fell on very bad and hard times for lots of reasons. But the temptation in the 50s and 60s to treat them as if they were the Bastille and knock them down and create something from scratch, like a year zero and build these community mental health centers that the federal government would fund with checks, but not administer so that really in the end, it was just a check that had no place to even go. Uh, that, that was part of the disaster. And that was a bureaucratic ambition. They wanted to federalize the system and get rid of the states. It was an incentive to the states to not allow Medicaid to reimburse states for people in long-term care facilities. So of course they obliged and let everyone go. And that's, uh, that was also a shock. But again, I understand why, because the images were so dreadful. At their worst, they looked horrible. And I think what you were saying about the pendulum is also a useful thing to remember. It was after the Holocaust. Photographs smuggled out of these state hospitals looked like liberated camps. Irving Goffman, who wrote a super influential book, a sociologist called Asylums, likened state hospitals to concentration camps and prisons, total institutions. And so, and the Nazis themselves had killed everybody in a state hospital. And so this notion of using biology as a way of denigrating and sorting people so horrified doctors that they almost retreated into psychoanalysis, even though medically everyone understood once there was antipsychotic medication, that it really was an organic brain disease because medication worked. But we're always entangled in the culture that we live in. And so 
it pays to be skeptical <laughs> and modest. That is so interesting. I so I, you know, speaking of states, I want to talk a little bit. I want to get to the city, but let's talk about the state first. How is our governor doing? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm just reading the news. You guys are the experts, but I'm reading about scout teams, subway co-response outreach. I mean, that's actually a joint city and state program, but we have a role in that as well. Yeah. So um, the scout program is our latest manifestation of this effort that we've been uh, uh, pushing uh, since 2022 um, to interpret the laws that we have, which really should be written with, with more explicit room for the people who, you know, I described who, who can't recognize their own need and are on a slow path of self-destruction. Um, th th there is actually room for them within the, the laws as they exist if we interpret them appropriately, right? The idea that a person has to be at imminent risk of harm actually doesn't appear in the law itself. That's kind of a spin it's a, that, that some people have, have placed on this law, which kind of speaks vaguely about a person's um, likelihood of, of, of uh, suffering serious physical harm if they don't receive treatment for the mental illness that they are exhibiting. Um, and if you actually look at how the courts have interpreted this vague statute over the years, most prominently the, the, the Billy Boggs case, the Joyce Brown is a, was a woman on the Upper East Side who the, who the city was able to secure treatment for, for in, in the 1980s. Um, and where the courts actually said inability to, to, uh, or to take care of oneself, if it's mental illness that causing it, is causing it, is actually a form of danger to self. And so what we've been trying to do as a city is get that message out to all the various professions we rely upon to interpret um, this law. Uh, and so that includes the outreach workers and, and, and police officers, which we're relying on just because we have so many of them encountering people in these situations, uh, and not ideal as that may be. We need them to understand what it means to be a danger to oneself in a broad sense. We need the doctors who make decisions about whether to admit and retain these patients once they're brought to the hospital to have that understanding. And of course, we have to have the judges, who as a city, we don't have a whole lot of control over, also be aware of, of what, what higher courts have said about what, what this law means. Um, and so the scout program, to kind of bring it back, is really about us trying to do that on the ground. We have teams, co-response teams, where we have police officers paired with clinicians and we put the clinician in the lead to engage with the person and have the police officer on hand uh, to maintain that, that clinician's safety and give them some comfort in kind of leaning into some of these scarier cases. Um, making decisions about whether people need to come to hospitals. Obviously, we're trying to get people to come on a voluntary basis if, if, if that's going to happen. But when it isn't, to actually invoke the law that lets them bring somebody to a hospital. Um, and starting them on that journey, on that path to recovery, right? It, it's a long process. There are lots of things we have to have in place. A lot of it is just about resources that we have to build into the system. But the first step of somebody's recovery from that state of crisis is to get them to the hospital. And the second step is to get them admitted and retained in that hospital long enough to stabilize and heal. And that's really what SCOUT is about. You know, these teams are, are actually actively looking for people in the subway system who meet this criteria as we've encouraged them to interpret it um, and are bringing people to the hospital. We're just doing this right now on a very small scale. We have two teams operating in Manhattan, but you know, in, in a couple of months, they were able to invoke this law uh, to involuntarily 20 times, another 115 people that, that, that were, were brought into care voluntarily. And we, we now have received some funding from the governor to expand this. Um, to, we have $20 million that we're going to use to, 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 to bring this up to 10 teams or more by, by next year. And Scout will soon be more of a regular presence in the subway system to where we can actually send these teams out to reports of people acting in ways that, that are disturbing. So something we're excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. So IMT is another a uh, really important um, city-funded and operated program where we have mobile teams that include psychiatrists uh, that are working with people uh, in, who are homeless uh, and have severe mental illness and, and, and you know, might otherwise be kind of hard to find if we're kind of reliant on them to come into a treatment center to get their medication. Because we have these mobile teams that have psychiatrists on board, we're actually finding them. We know where they hang out. Um, and, and um, you know, are bringing services to them and also establishing bonds of trust 
and rapport that are hopefully, and, and we're finding over time, actually are leading people to accept um, a placement in, in, in a, a specialized mental health shelter and ultimately allowing that to, to, to get them into uh, permanent supportive housing. So there's some good things happening. I'll just add about the IMTs that when my daughter, the one who was 10 when I started writing and 20 when I finished, was home from college, she is an EMT there as well and wants to be a nurse. And I was invited to spend a day with an IMT. And so I brought my daughter and it was like a perfect father-daughter day. And she had volunteered at a homeless shelter and knew and, and done ride-alongs. And the first thing you feel when you meet this team is that they're all going right to heaven. They're just incredibly committed. There are the peer counselors, the social workers, there's the nurse practitioner. They go down a list who gets assisted outpatient medication, who likes it if you bring the dog, who is in this on this corner. And you realize how why it's so hard to take psychiatry to scale because their intimate awareness of who the people are, who needs cleaning materials because they've just finally gotten into a place and they want they want someone to come and help them because they don't feel they can clean. But like the intimacy of the knowledge was part of the service and they were fully committed to it. It was just incredibly moving, but very, very labor intensive. And there should be a lot of them. I remember, Julie, when we talked earlier this week and you said one size do not, does not fit all. Well, I have said this many, <clears throat> excuse me, many times. What differentiates people that we see every day who are homeless with severe mental illness and other disabil other chronic disabilities is they, ha they are s desperately poor and desperately isolated. And as my sister's example, she absolutely would have been on the street had there not been the resources against all odds to make sure that didn't happen. Um, and we, it, it, it continues to break my heart to see what's happening on the streets. And, you know, and it's a really complicated problem to solve in part because if the person is actually able to stay in the hospital long enough to be treated and to feel better, there has to be a place for that person to go where that person is supported and has a sense of belonging. And that means in community in our city, which means that there's a social contract with the community. The place where the person is living has to be a decent place and the person has to respect the fact that they live in a in a community that's larger than themselves um, and what has also happened unfortunately over the past that this started under Cuomo too is there isn't one size fits all for supportive housing and my sister was a great example she was able to live relatively independently with service supports for a while she got sicker. There was no way she could do that anymore. And so she was able to be in a higher service enriched adult home run by a very good nonprofit organization. What is happening in New York now is because the State Office of Mental Health, and I, you might not agree with me on this, has basically abdicated its responsibility for financing and funding higher levels of service enrichment, there is an enormous pressure on the city to place people with much higher level needs in relatively low service supportive housing, which is not good for that person. It is not good for the other tenants in the building and it is not good for the community. And it is not good for the nonprofit who's trying to balance all these competing interests. Um, and so, you know, I sort of think of sort of the golden time for all of this work was in the mid 1990s um, under Mayor Giuliani, believe it or not, but there was intense cooperation between the city and state 
in a New York, New York agreement that was created by David Dickens and Mario Cuomo to fully finance supportive housing for serious mentally ill people. And a number of studies were done on the outcome of that. 85% of the people who were placed were stably housed two years afterwards. Literally ended homelessness and at no extra cost to the various systems they were cycling through. There was a coordinated streamlined system. There were resources in hospitals if somebody who was living in supported housing needed to go back into the hospital. This is a chronic brain disease. It's not just some, you know, oh yeah, I'll take a pill and I'm cured. That's become far more difficult. And so, and in the 1990s, the single adult homeless shelter was reduced by 50%. And we forget those things. We forget that we actually can, as a community, as a city, as a society, make tremendous inroads here. And we've done it. And I believe we can do it again. Some of it's gonna require being able to treat people in hospitals. And some people are gonna require very long-term care. It's a very small number. I mean, that's the other thing, maybe Brian, you wanna talk about. The vast majority of people with serious mental illness with the proper supports can live in community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the goal is right to get each individual into the least restrictive environment that's appropriate for them. And um, you know, for some people, we just have to acknowledge the reality that that's going to be an institutional setting. That's not a system failure. That's meeting that person where they are. Right. But it, it, and as you say, it's, it's not the case for most people with severe mental illness. They can function and, and, and thrive in supportive housing. But again, as you say, th that supportive housing has to include the services that, 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 that meet their particular needs. And you know, supportive housing can't be one size fits all. And two of the particular services that I think people with the most severe illness require to do well in supportive housing are actually the hardest things to find housing providers who are willing that are willing to offer and that, that would be medication management and representative payee services that is actually managing folks money um they're not funded thanks it's not that they won't do it they do not have the funding stream to have the nurse practitioner or the psychiatrist very few of them do and they don't have the funding to staff representative payee. It's a wholly different funding level. Um, and in the old days, really great adult homes, one of them that my sister lived in, had both of those services. They were bleeding money. I mean, the, the project could never have stood on its own two feet. It was the good graces of incredibly driven, mission-driven people that enabled my sister to have both the rep payee and medication management. That just shouldn't be. We have some questions from the audience, and I think we, we have a little bit of time. Um, so let me ask, ask you a few of these. This one is about um, police violence. Um, she writes, or he writes, I am heartbroken by the police killing of um, Wynne Rosario. Wynn Rosario this past March, Wynn was killed after calling 911 and a mental health, in a mental health emergency, NYPD officers arrived on the scene and killed Rosario minutes later. What is being done to break the chain of violence as the first response to mental illness and what should be done? Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, a huge concern. Um, I think there are a, a bunch of things that are happening now and, and, and probably have to happen on a larger scale. One of them, of course, is better training for police officers. You know, we'd all like to live in a world where we could simply send mental health professionals to the sites of, of, of these crisis situations and not be reliant on police. And to some extent, we are trying to find the, the situations that don't necessarily require police involvement and send purely clinical teams out. We have a program called Be Heard, um, which is uh, allowing 911 operators to identify those situations and, 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 and keep police out of response when, when possible and appropriate. But you know, it's also 
a reality that when the situations involve a potential risk of violence, when you have someone who is acting out in a way that potentially poses uh, an imminent risk of harm for somebody, you really can't make that ha that response happen uh, without without including police. Even if you can, you know, send a co-response team, you've got to have police on the scene, and that really means that police training is such an important and inescapable part of how we do better on this front. And you know, we have a program called CIT Crisis Intervention Training. It's a national um, model where, where officers receive a, a, a week of training on how to defuse and recognize situations that don't necessarily require a, an aggressive response. And that, that's being delivered now to officers as they go through the academy. We are over a period of years trying to get to a place where every officer who has who's, uh, uh, involvement in the force predates the, the, the creation of this program also gets the training, but you know it takes time because we're taking officers off the job to, to receive it. So that effort is ongoing, and I think we're, we're close to, to getting to full um, CIT training for our entire department. Um, and uh, yeah, and I also think a, another part of it is to make sure we have more clinicians out there doing outreach so that we are not as respondent, as reliant on cops who just kind of observe things happening in the street. You know, we actually have legislation uh, that we've proposed to Albany that would expand the range of clinicians that can do that kind of outreach work and make decisions to bring people to hospitals, uh, which would go a long way to kind of taking this burden, I think, away from police officers. Add that I think it's part of what people need to think about. Once the crisis comes, it's much harder to do anything. And just as people who might tell themselves that they're defending the right to freedom when they are really um, defending would need to consider the possibility that the person whose right to freedom they're defending might easily wind up at Rikers or in prison uh, or dying on the street, that they're not arguing. It, it's their own fantasy of what freedom would mean for them. Medication is one of those issues that if given in advance, which sometimes requires assisted outpatient treatment or some way of compelling care, it makes it much less likely that this will happen. I know that when Michael, towards the end, is arrested after he's killed Carrie, he, I talked to the police officers who are amazing people. He knocked one woman out, and he was, with extraordinary strength, fought off these two huge people. And the lieutenant had unstrapped his gun, because what he said to me is the next level of force, since these sticks, these hickory sticks were not bringing him down, would be to use to shoot him. And it happens that they did bring him down and subdue him. But he literally, you could still see, this was 20 years later, he said I, he almost shot a naked, unarmed man because no one knew what to do. And that is um, sort of, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not important to know what the worst things are so that you live in fear of them. It's because there, the more you can do as part of a general sense of care, the, the less it comes down to a police officer or a parent in a crisis moment. I can't believe that we are almost out of time. I mean, we're really pretty much out of time, but I, I want to ask this one final question um, because I think we're all looking for um, solutions and models, things that work. And somebody asks, is there a country that is considered a model for handling severely mental ill citizens? Is there somebody that we should imitate out there? uninformed just observation um, I have been traveling to Israel for the past 16 years and I'm a urban person and I walk the streets all the time and in the first number of years that I would be wandering around the cities I would notice there was nobody living on the street and there was nobody living on the streets who looked horribly ill. And I started just started asking people like, you know, this isn't an issue. And it, I think the answer was a combination of things. There is a strong social welfare state and safety net. There are extremely equipped 
across cultures, across political divides, incredibly strong community networks, incredibly strong familial networks. People look out for each other. There is a healthcare system that functions and a mental health care system where people can avail themselves of psychiatric care. And you have all of those things, and lo and behold, you do not see on the streets what we're seeing here. Uh, I don't, I do think it's a combination of the strong sense of community, culture, strong network, strong safety net, strong healthcare system. Those are the things that make this work. Anything to add? Well, that, I mean, yes, of course. That's No, not yes, I have something to add, but there are 330 million people in this country, and we're very urban. And I feel like people are always saying there's an amazing place in the Netherlands and what they're actually describing when they describe that place is an asylum. It's in a rural place and it's a community of people. I do think that although community mental health failed for all kinds of reasons and psychiatry failed for all kinds of reasons, just as psychiatry is kind of putting itself back together again, it has now made woken up from its psychoanalytic dream. It's made peace with the brain, the biological part of the brain but understands you still need to under know people individually. I'd like to think that community mental health would now be supportive housing that's serious about what medication is, that requires it for those who need it, and that will create those kinds of communities. The most uh, successful communities that were created for in like the 50s was something called Fountain House, people who were discharged from psychiatric hospitals who got together and created a community for each other. And so we will have to create them, but Julie, you are creating them. And if we can acknowledge what the needs are and be honest about it, I think it, most people don't need to be hospitalized, but if they do, they can and should be. And all the pieces that used to be in an asylum, including time, which people don't get much in a city, need to be reincorporated into how we think about right. caring for people. My friend Michael was in a hospital for eight months after his psychotic break. He, he described it like prison, and I always thought how terrible it was that they had locked him up. It was the best thing for him because he needed more than eight months to begin to become stabilized in a way that allowed him to actually function quite well afterwards. So I'm not, I don't know if that, as long as people like Julie and Brian keep doing what they're doing, I feel like we can recreate what had been so thoughtlessly exp tried before wouldn't underestimate the intangible of compassion, care, empathy, love, some modicum of tolerance for idiosyncrasy. I don't think anyone should tolerate violence or fear or feeling like you're in danger. But we all need a, a tiny bit of tolerance to all live together. Uh, and a tiny bit of flexibility to all live together. Um, and in so many ways, those things are the secret sauce because everyone wants to feel like they belong somewhere. They do. That is a beautiful note to end on. I want to thank all of you for this incredible conversation. Um, I learned so much, and I want to thank all of you for for being here and the book again is the best minds it's mind-blowing um sorry uh anyway can we have a round of applause for our panel thank you